On December the 10th, 1923, the Nobel Prize was awarded, according to tradition at the time, in the Celebration Hall of the Royal Musical Academy at Neubrookhain 11 in Stockholm. But this year was different. The awardees of the prize in physiology or medicine, Frederick G. Banting and John J. R. MacLeod from Toronto, Canada, were unable to attend the ceremony and their prize was received by the ambassador of the British Commonwealth in Stockholm as an intermediary. Behind the laureate's non-appearance was widespread internal and external dissatisfaction, not with awarding the discovery of insulin itself, but with the specific choice of laureates. Should both, or only one of them, possibly in combination with a co-worker, have received the award instead? The choice of John MacLeod was questioned, and when Banting received a telegram from the Nobel Committee that he had been awarded, he was so angry that MacLeod was offered the same honour that he initially refused to accept the prize. He was, however, eventually persuaded to accept, but decided that he would share the prize money with his associate, Charles Best. MacLeod decided likewise and shared his part with the biochemist James Collip. In this documentary, we'll give our view of the problems that were associated with this Nobel Prize from today's perspective. The first section summarises the development of knowledge about diabetes until the beginning of the 1920s, while evaluation of Nobel activities at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm are scrutinised in the middle section. Finally, some later advances based on the discovery of insulin and of great importance to the treatment of diabetes will be reviewed. The oldest text in which a condition that may be diabetes is mentioned is most likely the Eber papyrus from about 1,500 years BC. On this papyrus you can read Get rid of urine of which there is too much. Another very early description of a condition believed to be diabetes is attributed to the Indian physician Mahashi Sharaka. He described people with polyuria, that is, very large amounts of urine, and noted that flies and ants were attracted to these people's urine. The Greek philosopher and physician Aratius who worked in Cappadocia around 130 to 200 AD, is the first to apply the still-used disease designation diabetes, which can be derived from a Greek word meaning to pass through, or siphon, referring to the large amounts of fluid that pass through the bodies of those affected by this disease. The Persian physician Ibn Sina, better known as Avicenna, is one of the foremost figures in the art of medicine. His famous medical encyclopedia, al Kanun, which was translated into Latin, was an important source of knowledge right into the 17th century and was studied through hundreds of years at European medical schools. To the best of our knowledge, he was the first to divide people with diabetes into two groups, one made up of the young and thin, and the other of older and overweight people. This is a description of what we presently recognise as diabetes type 1 and type 2. It was the famous English physician Thomas Willis who added the word mellitus, meaning sweet or honey, to the term diabetes. The reason was that he had noticed that the urine of people with this disease had a sweet taste. Barely 100 years later, the English physician Matthew Dobson noted that the sweet urine, after drying, left behind a white substance 
which turned out to be sugar. He also noted that blood from people with diabetes mellitus tasted sweet. This led him to assume that a high level of sugar in the blood caused the excretion of sugar in the urine. These observations, which he published in the journal Medical Observations in 1776, brought to mind the cardinal symptom of the disease, elevated blood sugar. Paul Langerhans was the first to describe that the pancreas contains both an exo and an endocrine part in his doctoral dissertation from 1869. The discovery was described as follows. In the pancreas, there are islands of clear cells scattered around the gland, which are coloured differently than the surrounding tissue. Langerhans underlined that these cell islands were richly innervated. The French physician, Etienne Lanceroux, was the first to realise that the pancreas had an important role in the disease diabetes mellitus. He based his opinion on microscopic examinations of pancreatic glands, comparing specimens obtained from people with and without urinary glucose excretion. Based on these observations, he coined the term pancreatic diabetes in 1877. He also distinguished two types of diabetes from each other and called them lean and fat diabetes, respectively. Of interest is that one of his well-known students was Nikolai Palescu. That the islets in the pancreas described by Langerhans were later named islets of Langerhans is to the merit of Gustave Edouard Lagesse. This French pathologist noted that these cell islets were altered in individuals who died of diabetes. Based on these observations, he hypothesised that they produced a blood sugar regulating secretion. Due to this, he made a substantial contribution to the subsequent discovery of hormones, in this case, insulin. The next important step in development was taken in a collaboration between the German doctors Oskar Minkowski and Josef von Mehring. These researchers noted that dogs deprived of their pancreas died of a disease that in every respect was like diabetes mellitus. Accordingly, they were able to verify that the pancreas produces a substance of crucial importance in the development of this disease. The biochemists Israel Simon Kleiner and Samuel James Meltzer, collaborators at the Rockefeller Institute in New York, were probably the first to establish that an aqueous extract from pieces of pancreas counteracted the increase of blood sugar induced by glucose injections in dogs deprived of their pancreatic glands. They also reported that this extract could lead to low blood sugar. The findings were presented in 1913 at a meeting of the National Academy of Sciences in Washington. After a break, seemingly due to the outbreak of World War I, Kleiner continued his experiments. In the autumn of 1919, he was able, as a sole author, to publish that pancreatic extracts, and not extracts from any other organs, contained a substance that lowered the blood sugar of dogs following extirpation of their pancreas. Kleiner wrote that his findings suggest a possible therapeutic application and wondered whether pancreatic extracts from other animal species might have similar properties. Insightfully, he added that effective agent or agents, their purification, concentration and identification are suggested as promising fields for further work. Nikolai Palescu was, as far as can be understood, the first to produce a pancreatic extract that normalised blood sugar in dogs with diabetes. He was born in Bucharest, where he received his basic education. He studied medicine in Paris, where he obtained his medical degree in 1897 and subsequently was employed as a doctor at a French hospital as a disciple of Etienne Lanceroux. This made him interested in diabetes. In 1900, he returned to his homeland, Romania, where he worked as a professor of medicine for the rest of his life. 
Paulesco initiated experiments with dogs deprived of their pancreas in 1912. He noted that their blood sugar increased and that they excreted glucose in their urine, that is, developed clear signs of diabetes. In 1916, he developed a saline-based extract from bovine pancreatic glands that was purified with hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide. It was named pangreine. Administered intravenously, this extract normalized blood sugar levels and reduced urinary glucose excretion in dogs that developed diabetes after having their pancreas removed. The experiments were interrupted when Paulescu was enlisted for military service in connection with the outbreak of World War I. After returning to his regular workplace in June 1921, Paulescu published his observations in the article Recherche sur le rôle du pancreas dans la simulation nutritive in the Archive internationale de physiologie Liège Belgique. He patented his method of producing pancreine, insulin, in April 1922 at the Romanian Ministry of Industry and Trade. All this happened before Banting and Best reported their experiments. In 1913, the Canadian-based British physiologist John J. R. MacLeod published an overview of current knowledge on diabetes mellitus. It gained its importance, among other things, because Frederick G. Banting approached him with his ideas about experiments with pancreatic extracts. The Canadian physician, Frederick G. Banting, who had studied surgery and orthopaedics, divided his time between a private medical practice and teaching at the University of Toronto. While preparing a lecture on diabetes, he read what had been written about the disease. Among other things, he became inspired by an article published in November 1920 by M. Barron in the journal Surgery, Gynaecology and Obstetrics, entitled Relation of the Islets of Langerhans to Diabetes with Special Reference to Cases of Pancreatic Lithiasis. Banting wrote down his thoughts as follows. Diabetes. Ligate pancreatic ducts of dogs. Keep dogs alive till arsene, degenerate leaving islets. Try to isolate the internal secretion of these to relieve glycosuria. Frederick G. Banting, who knew that John MacLeod, a few years before, had summarised knowledge of diabetes, approached him in the spring of 1921 with his idea. MacLeod became interested and provided Banting with laboratory facilities and dogs for the proposed experiments. He also suggested that a student should help him. The person was chosen by lot, and the winner was Charles H. Best. The experiments began in the summer of 1921. The pancreatic duct was ligated, destroying the exocrine cells that produce digestive enzymes. Thereafter, the remaining parts of the gland were homogenized and filtered into an extract of the islets of Langerhans. Dogs that developed diabetes after their pancreases were removed could then be kept alive for several months by injecting them with the extract, which was called Islatine. MacLeod recognised the importance of what Banting and Best achieved, but understood that the experiments needed further refinement before firm conclusions could be drawn about the effect of Islatine. Under his leadership, the experiments were expanded and supplemented. In addition, he recruited a biochemist, James B. Collip, to the group, with the task of eliminating side effects related to impurities of the injected extract. In January 1922, he developed a method to produce a non-toxic pancreatic extract, which later that month led to the treatment of the first patient, Lionel Thompson. This 13-year-old boy, who was dying of his diabetes, survived until the age of 27, when he, probably as a complication of his diabetes, died of pneumonia. The results of the research that led to the discovery of insulin were for the first time presented on December 30th, 1921, 
at the annual meeting of the American Physiological Society in New Haven, where Banting gave a presentation entitled The Beneficial Influences of Certain Pancreatic Extracts on Pancreatic Diabetes. The first, more extensive publication was presented in 1922 in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, with Banting, Best, Collip, Campbell and Fletcher as authors. For the discovery of insulin, Frederick G. Banting and John J. R. MacLeod were awarded the 1923 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. This Nobel Prize is throughout time one of the fastest awarded prizes in relation to the time of discovery, as well as one of the most debated. Ever since the first Nobel Prizes were awarded in 1901, until the formation of the Nobel Assembly in 1978, the College of Teachers at the Karolinska Institute, with the support of a Nobel Committee appointed by the College, was responsible for the work that each year was associated with the decision of who should be awarded the prize in physiology or medicine. The Nobel Committee was responsible for the investigational work and thereby had a great influence on the choice of laureates. In 1923, the College of Teachers was comprised of 23 professors, while the Nobel Committee consisted of three regular members, Gunnar Hedrian, Jöns Johansson and Fritjof Lenmalm, appointed by the College for a three-year period as well as a scientific secretary, Jöran Liljestrand, appointed by the Karolinska Institute in 1918, at a time when he was neither professor nor member of the teaching staff at the Karolinska Institute. If needed, two additional members appointed by the college could be added to the committee, but then only for a period of one year. At the Nobel Committee's first meeting on February 1st, 1923, with participation of the three regular members and the secretary, the nominations received before the end of the nomination period on January the 31st were discussed. Two prize candidates had been nominated for the discovery of insulin, both for the first time. Frederick G. Banting by G. W. Kreil from Cleveland, F. G. Benedict from Boston and A. Krog from Copenhagen. John J. R. MacLeod by G. Stewart from Cleveland and A. Krog from Copenhagen. The three ordinary members of the Nobel Committee participated together with the secretary in the second meeting with two adjunct members, Professors Hans Christian Jacobius and Jon Hörqvist. Proposals for so-called special investigations were outlined. Jacobius and Hörqvist were proposed to investigate Banting and MacLeod from a clinical and from a basic scientific point of view, respectively. Both had previous experience of working in the College of Teachers and of conducting such investigations. Based on these investigations, a final decision was made by the College. The three ordinary members and the two adjunct members participated in the third meeting, but not the secretary the special investigations were discussed. Jacobius summarised his opinion as follows. I therefore believe that the discovery of insulin can be awarded a Nobel Prize already this year. It's more difficult to decide who should be awarded. Banting brought his idea to MacLeod and developed insulin under MacLeod's direction. Because of what I have stated here, I am most inclined to recommend that Banting and MacLeod jointly received the Nobel Prize. Hörqvist concluded, With respect to the possible allocation and division of the award, I agree with the proponent who believes that it should be awarded jointly to Banting and MacLeod. Banting must have the credit for idea and initiative. Judging by the publications made and statements from those concerned, MacLeod, 
at whose institution the investigation was carried out, was the leader of the scientific investigation work, and it should not be doubted that without his great effort, the discovery would not have gained the importance it already has achieved. The discussion about the awarding of the Nobel Prize for 1923 was completed with this as a background. The decision was to propose the College of Teachers to award Frederick G. Banting and John J. R. MacLeod for their discovery of insulin. The proposal for recipients of the 1923 Nobel Prize, prepared at the previous meeting, had, after discussion in the College of Teachers, been returned to the Nobel Committee, with the request that Professor Adolf Peterson should be given the opportunity to participate. Professor Peterson had submitted a letter stating, From what has been communicated, it seems to me to be clear that, based on the investigation presented, it is impossible to decide whether the prize should be awarded to Banting or MacLeod, or both, jointly. I therefore request that the decision on awarding the work in question should be delayed pending a more comprehensive investigation. The proposal was discussed, but did not cause any change to the previous conclusion. The decision was finalised at the meeting of the College of Teachers on the 25th of October and made public the same day. As already mentioned, Banting and his collaborators published their first results in early 1922. The information gained great attention and spread quickly. It is likely that the primary interest among a majority of those who read about the discovery was to get access to insulin as quickly as possible to treat their patients. To nominate the discoverers for a Nobel Prize was probably considered less urgent. It is therefore not surprising that only two candidates were nominated by only four people for the 1923 Nobel Prize for the discovery of insulin by the end of the proposal period, January the 31st, 1923. But there was an exception. The Romanian N.C. Paulescu, who published similar results half a year earlier in a French-language scientific journal. Paulescu's work was cited by Banting and co-workers, but much suggests that it was done incorrectly. Michael Bliss summarised in 1982 how he perceived this situation in his book The Discovery of Insulin. Sometime during October to December 1921, Banting's colleague, Charles Best, would have read Paulescu's work. He summarised his thoughts on it on a so-called index card. The index card suggests that Best did not find Paulescu's paper particularly impressive. Best had a very rudimentary reading knowledge in French. It's obvious from his note that he misunderstood a key sentence in the article. The misreading added to the coolness of the summary of Paulescu's work. Banting and Best do not seem to have given much further thought to Paulescu. Banting and his co-workers' way of citing Paulescu may have led to those invited to nominate candidates for the Nobel Prize getting the impression that Paulescu's works were uninteresting. In any case, it does not seem that the reviewers of Banting's and MacLeod's works, Professors Jacobius and Huerkvist, were inspired to look more closely at his achievements. None of them mentioned him in their investigations, and Paulescu was not even nominated. What then led to the Nobel Prize for the discovery of insulin being jointly awarded to Banting and MacLeod. To award the discovery of insulin already in 1923 was probably, as seen by the College of Teachers and the Nobel Committee, to have symbolic value. The intention, expressed by Alfred Nobel in his will, was to annually award as a prize to those who during the past year have done humanity the greatest good. As already mentioned, the awarded combination, Banting and MacLeod, had only been nominated by August Krog, a former Nobel laureate and well known to the members of the College of Teachers. 
As a new Nobel laureate, he was invited to lecture in the United States in 1921, but had to decline when his wife, Marie Krog, developed diabetes herself. In the autumn of 1922, they were able to travel and discussed the discovery of insulin at a dinner in Boston with the diabetes specialist Elliot P. Joslin. Marie Krog persuaded her husband to change his travel plans and visit Toronto. During November the 23rd to the 25th, 1922, he stayed as a guest in the home of MacLeod. The purpose of his changed travel plans did, however, not relate to the Nobel Prize, but was to gain access to the insulin production method in Toronto. As a result, two insulin producing companies were founded as early as 1925. Novo Therapeutische Laboratorium and Nordisk Insulin Laboratorium. Presently, they are united in Novo Nordisk RS. Based on his experiences from the visit to Toronto, Krogh formulated his nomination of Banting and MacLeod in a very clear way. The credit for the idea that led to the discovery undeniably belongs to Dr. Banting, who is a young and obviously very talented man. However, he certainly would not have been able to carry out the investigations on his own, which from the beginning and through all stages were supervised by Professor MacLeod. The other authors must be described as MacLeod's and Banting's co-workers, but there is a reason to highlight the chemist J.B. Collip in particular. However, I do not think that the reason to include Collip in the prize award is sufficient. The conclusion in the nomination agrees well with Professors Jacobius and Quirkvist's conclusions in their special investigations. It is well known that Krogh had a trusting collaboration and regular correspondence with Jaran Lillestrand, who, since 1918, had been the secretary of the Nobel Committee for many years. It is reasonable to assume that he had great knowledge of and experience with the Nobel workings and accordingly a great influence on the discussions in the committee. With this in mind, it is interesting to take note of what Professor Torgny Kuerstrand wrote about him in his 1987 book, Truth is a Child of Its Time. Lilia Strand had a great verbal talent, but did not reveal any evidence of technical ability or abstract thinking. He went through the essays as a textbook teacher corrects essays, still advocating very definite opinions, which he took from some authorities he looked up to. One of them was August Krogh. That the discovery of insulin was awarded with a Nobel Prize has never been disputed. In contrast, the choice of the award winner has been discussed ever since the award was announced. In this work, we have, through studies of the archives of the Medical Nobel Committee, tried to evaluate the basis behind the choice that was made. The factors behind the selection of award winners can be summarised as follows. The great theoretical and practical significance of the discovery. The timing of the discovery that coincided with the intention in Alfred Nobel's will, which is rather unusual. Only two scientists had been nominated. The person who had nominated the combination of these two was a former Nobel laureate himself, in whom members of the Nobel Committee had great confidence. The two appointed investigators agreed that both nominees were worthy of the prize. But there were undeniably several arguments favouring that one should have postponed the awarding to get access to more complete nomination and investigational material since the decision-making assembly and the College of Teachers did not agree. The time between the awardee's first publication and the end of the nomination period was only 11 months. A language confusion caused the work of a potential competitor to be misinterpreted, and the evaluation seems to have been limited to the work of the nominated candidates only. Banting, Best and Collip patented their insulin extract in December 1922 and sold all rights to the University of Toronto for one Canadian dollar. 
Later, the patent was extended to the United States and several other countries. The very large incomes from the patent financed continued research. In 1928, MacLeod returned to his native Scotland and was awarded a royal professorship at the University of Aberdeen. It has been debated why he moved. Besides the fact that it may have been natural to go back to his motherland, the animosity that developed between him and Bunting has been indicated as an important reason. The latter believed that MacLeod stole the rights of the insulin discovery from him and apparently neglected no opportunity to cast doubt on MacLeod. Both Charles Best and James Collip continued in their scientific careers and both were very successful. Best was nominated for a Nobel Prize on seven occasions between 1950 and 1961 and Collip eight times between 1928 and 1956, although for achievements other than the discovery of insulin. Even if they did not receive the prize, it tells a lot about their importance as scientists. It was worse for Banting, who in his continued research tried to find a solution to the cancer enigma without success. Accordingly, his fame rests more or less completely on the discovery of insulin. Paulescu's role has been emphasised. The discussion about the 1923 Nobel laureates has continued long after the prize was awarded. As already mentioned, it is not only Paulescu's efforts that have been considered obsolete, but Kleiner's as well. His role is highlighted very clearly in the book The Priority of N.C. Paulescu in the Discovery of Insulin by Eon Pavel, published in 1976. Best's already mentioned mistranslation is commented upon in a letter dated 1969 by the same in the following way. I regret very much that there was an error in our translation of Professor Paulescu's article and, in any case, I would like to state how sorry I am for this unfortunate error and I trust your efforts to honour Professor Paulescu will be rewarded with great success. Discoveries in which insulin had a central role continued to be relevant in the context of the Nobel Prize. Thus, the 1958 prize in chemistry was awarded to the British molecular biologist Frederick Sanger for his work on the structures of proteins, especially insulin, 37 years after its original discovery in 1921. Nineteen years later, Rosalind S. Yallo received one-third of the 1977 prize in physiology or medicine for the development of a radioimmunological method for the determination of body insulin. From 1921 until about 1960, insulin was produced as a purified product from the pancreas of animals, initially dogs but later cattle. These two Nobel Prize awarded discoveries paved the way for production of synthetic insulin. In conclusion, there is no doubt whatsoever that the discovery of insulin was of such stature that it deserved a Nobel Prize. This fact has never been questioned during the debate that followed. The discussion has always circled around to whom the prize rightfully should have been awarded. In this documentary, we wanted to draw attention to a few matters. First, that the discovery, like many if not most scientific discoveries, rests on previous scientific achievements. As seen, there were quite a lot of those in terms of diabetes and its cure, insulin. Several of the early observations were made at a time when some scientific instruments, for example those enabling the ability to determine blood sugar quickly and reliably, were not yet fully developed. The breakthrough came around 1920, when the time was ripe. Furthermore, we wanted to emphasise how important it is that scientists carefully study and correctly cite the important contributions of their predecessors, Finally, we wanted to underline the importance that those who nominate for a Nobel Prize, as well as those who are appointed as investigators of candidates for this very prestigious and highly sought-after scientific award, ascertain that they carefully study not only the works of the nominees, but also survey the current topic from a broader perspective.
In these respects, we believe that the history behind the 1923 Nobel Prize for the discovery of insulin offers both interesting information and important knowledge 